The Real ID Act was crafted to address two political problems. First, in order to uh, circumvent public opposition to the creation of a federally managed or federally issued ID card or identity database, uh, the Real ID Act mandated uh, and was designed to mandate uh, the creation of a distributed database, which would function as a single one uh, in which a single query could retrieve data from 55 uh, state and territorial uh, identity databases while the data remained at the state level. Um, the second political problem, uh, Jim having, I think, accurately recounted the, the opposition, which everybody knew there was going to be at the state level, was how to coerce states into uh, collaborating with the Real ID Act, even though the federal government knew it had no authority directly to mandate that. There are actually two key actions that were required uh, in order to create the database. And there's been talk about ID cards. Really, the Real ID Act is about the database. Um, and two things, one, the construction of the hub that would enable these state databases to function as a single distributed database. That's been done, unfortunately. Um, the second, though, which is the phase we're now in, is getting each of those 55 states and territories to plug in to that hub so that its records could be searched by that single query. And the device that was adopted as a way to coerce states was to indirectly get to them by threatening to punish residents of states that didn't comply, i.e. plug their database into the federal hub, uh, contractors hub, so the feds can say we don't touch it, but um, develop to beat the federal mandate, punish residents of those states for the actions of their state legislatures by not accepting ID from non-compliant states when presented by their residents for federal purposes. And so the essence of real ID enforcement is the rollout of these sanctions against individual residents of non-compliant states who are trying to use ID for federal purposes. So it all rests on what are the circumstances in which one presents ID for a federal purpose. The Real ID regulations define two, access to federal facilities and travel by commercial aircraft. The first of those is addressed in the phase of Real ID implementation, which subject to an indefinite number of future postponements by rulemaking or rulemaking by press release, as Jim has alluded to, currently scheduled to begin on October 10th of this year, is a requirement to uh, use re uh, to, uh, or a threat to deny access to federal facilities to those with non-compliant ID if those facilities have been designated as federal security level three, four, or five. What are those facilities, if any? We don't know. No list has been made public. We asked for the guidelines for assigning these federal security levels, and they're very disturbing. For example, it's a point score that's to be used where the same number of points is awarded for a facility having been the target of political protest as for having been the target of violent attack. Um, be, having been a place where citizens exercise their right to petition for redress of grievances is defined for purposes of assigning a federal security level as tantamount to violent terrorism. But we then, we made an experiment with uh, uh, Filing Freedom of Information Act requests that were based in San Francisco for some of the local uh, federal facilities to see whether they've been assigned these levels. We started, of course, with the most conspicuous potential symbolic terrorist target on the West Coast, the Golden Gate Bridge, each end of which is in a different federal facility. When we asked, neither of them had any record that any consideration had ever been given to assigning any federal security level, much less one high enough to trigger the real ID regulations. We asked next about the San Francisco-Oakland Bay Bridge, actually an even more critical piece of critical infrastructure, the center of which passes through an island, which is a federal reservation. Had they assigned a federal security level? No. We asked the General Service Administration, which administers the U.S. District Courthouse, the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals Courthouse, federal office buildings, et cetera, et cetera. Um, they, too, have to date found no record that any of these have been assigned a federal security level. So this whole elaborate-looking schema may be quite hollow.
But even, we actually did hear afterwards that apparently in response to our inquiries, they started thinking about now they're going to assign a security level to the Golden Gate Bridge because we asked. But even if this were to be done, uh, there is still an important exception in the real ID regulations as there has to be. DHS knows full well that there's no statutory authority um, or constitutional authority for conditioning many federal benefits, rights, um, on or access to buildings, on presenting ID. Um, and so they've included in their real ID specifications that access to federal facilities will be allowed regardless of whether you have compliant ID for purposes of receiving federal benefits, which is the main reason people would want or need to access federal facilities. People don't like hang around in federal buildings for the fun of it. Um, at least most people outside the Beltway don't. Um, so it's really, that's the smaller piece. As, as Jim alluded to in his introduction, the core of whether there's any teeth to real ID is whether people will be prevented from flying. That will be phase four of Real ID Act implementation as a date to be named later that can be set back as far in the future, not earlier than next year, and well, it could easily go another 10 years. Um, there's no reason the current standoff couldn't occur. And there have been other standoffs over state compliance, even state driver's license department compliance with federal desires that have gone on for much longer than the 10 years of the Real ID Act. It's, these deadlines don't mean much of anything. But whenever, if that happens, um, the implicit threat of the TSA and DHS has been, if we don't accept your state ID, you won't be allowed to fly. That is not true. Not only is there an international treaty right to travel, not only is there a constitutional uh, right to assemble, there is an explicit federal statutory right to travel by air. There is an explicit federal statutory mandate to DHS in issuing regulations to consider the public right of transit through the navigable airspace. Um, and in fact, despite the threats that have been made, the official, and despite signs, false, admittedly false signs posted by DHS in every airport that you must show ID, the legal position of DHS and TSA in every case in which this issue has been arise, the, has arisen, the consistent legal position has been that there is no federal statute or regulation that requires you to show any ID credentials in order to travel. That was the position that persuaded the Ninth Circuit uh, to reach its very otherwise very bad decision in Gilmore versus Gonzalez in 2006. That was the testimony that I heard from TSA witnesses in the criminal trial of Phil Mosick in 2011 when he was falsely arrested at the behest of the TSA for trying to document the process of flying without ID because although they know that legally they must recognize this right, they are loath to have the public discover that they have this right. They want us to forget our fundamental right to travel. But the reality is that people fly without ID every day. And this is what the TSA says in litigation. We have a process for that. We don't require ID. There are alternative ways. Um, We've tried to find out what happened. Um, we filed uh, Freedom of Information Act requests for the reports that the TSA prepares every day, uh, summarizing how many people have tried to fly without ID and what happened. In two years, they've managed to process and release only one day of sample data from a date about just about a year ago in May of 2014. But on that date, May 6, 2014, 129 people in this country tried to get on airplanes without showing ID that the TSA deemed acceptable. Of that 129, 120 were allowed to fly after having their ID verified through a bizarre and objectionable process that involved calling up a call center that queries a commercial data broker, we think it's Axiom, although we haven't been able to tell for sure, ask you a game of 20 questions and sees if your answers match what they're finding in your Axiom file. And if they match, they let you on the plane. The other... Uh, the remaining nine people, six of them, their ID couldn't be verified, but they were allowed to fly anyway at the discretion, which is to say whim of the federal security director in charge on duty at that moment at the airport. Three people, two and a half percent of those who tried to fly without ID were actually turned away. 
Now, these were gross breaches of those rights, of those three. One was turned away because they couldn't find an Axiom file for him. Is not having an Axiom file a crime or cause for denial of your rights? A second was turned away because they chose to exercise their right to remain silent when interrogated by the TSA. Um, and a third was denied the right to fly because their answers did not match what was in the file supplied by the current, uh, by the uh, data broker on questions such as who resides at the same address or nearby. Now, I don't know that I could accurately tell you who Axiom thinks I live with or who Axiom thinks live next door, where there is a household full of day laborers and rooms are sublet for cash by the master tenant, and even the landlord doesn't know who actually knows lives there. But objectionable though that is, that's, again, a tiny percentage of those who uh, tried to fly without ID were actually turned away. So the real threat is not, we're going to prevent your residents from flying if you don't vote to plug your state motor vehicle database into the real ID hub. The real threat is we will harass your residents with more intrusive searches, with interrogation, with delay um, if you don't uh, collaborate with real ID. And so the crux of whether real ID sanctions uh, can be used to coerce the states rests on the legality of these kinds of low or lower grade harassments, as well as the legality of turning people away from flying. So people who oppose real ID need to get involved now in challenging these kinds of harassments of travelers, uh, as well as challenging issues of denial of access to federal buildings and other federal facilities to people who don't have ID. The leading case on that being the terrible memorandum opinion from the Ninth Circuit in Foti versus McHugh. Um, but uh, what I do envision, given that enforcement is going to rest on ratcheting up harassment of the residents of non-compliant states, we are going to see litigation. So what are the issues that that litigation is going to present? Um, again, it's going to be about access to buildings and primarily about the right to fly. Who's going to bring it? Unfortunately, the states won't directly have standing. The injured people will be the individuals. States that want to oppose Real ID need to be coming forward now and making a commitment to their residents that they will defend their right to travel and that if the federal government chooses to interfere with the rights of their residents because it doesn't like the state IDs that are being issued, um, that the states are able, willing, and prepared to intervene as a Miki to vigorously defend the rights of their residents against federal interference. The standard of review is also a problem. Mostly these are going to be reviews of actions taken by the TSA. And if we're going to have meaningful judicial review of those actions, we need to repeal not only the Real ID Act, which we do need to repeal, but in the meantime, we also need to repeal 49 U.S. Code 46110, which is the jurisdiction statute enacted to attempt to protect the TSA against any kind of judicial review. Under that statute, TSA orders can be reviewed only by the circuit courts, not by district courts. They're not able to conduct any trial or fact-finding, and they're required to uh, conduct their review under a deferential standard of review that accepts any TSA fact-finding of fact supported by any evidence in the record, regardless of how much countervailing evidence is in the administrative record. And of course, they review it only on the administrative record supplied by the TSA itself. If we're going to meaningfully litigate, that needs to be one of our targets. But fundamentally, um, along with that litigation, the effort to indirectly coerce the states is predicated on the assumption that individuals whose rights are violated, who are turned back by TSA staff or TSA contractors at an airport or by building guards at a federal building, when they are trying to exercise their rights, the TSA and the federal government hope that those people will blame their state legislature? I think they're wrong. The American people are smarter than that. People whose rights are denied by the feds, by federal agents because of federal law, will blame the people who are responsible. The TSA agents who are blocking their way to get on the plane for which they hold a valid ticket. Uh, the Department of Homeland Security that issued the regulations directing that 
and fundamentally the people in Congress who enacted that law. And if the feds think that they can somehow misdirect the Real ID rebellion at the state legislatures who's been standing up for their residents' rights, they're just wrong.